Are we on? All right. Awesome. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really happy that you all could make it here, especially on this beautiful Saturday afternoon when it's a, a tough to be inside, I think, with all the sunshine. Um, I'm Lucy Hayward, and I brought my uh, friend Mark Bronner along with me today. And we're going to talk to you a little bit about cyber incident response planning. And we're also going to talk through, um, we'll probably share some examples of some things that we've worked on. Um, especially recently, and um, you know, and then open it up for any questions. So we go through this. If you have any questions, please feel free to jump in and just ask, and we'll do our best to um, answer them. Well, I'll let Mark introduce himself first, since he's first on the list. All right. So I'm Mark Runner. Um, about 20 years in IT, 16 years in security, uh, about seven years spent running an incident response team for a Fortune 200 company, about 50,000 users all over the world. Uh, I'm a Lipscomb grad, so. Um, Gosh, 20 years, 20 years ago, I guess, um, was here and got my computer science degree and did a little hacking and spunking around. And I guess at that time, the first thing that I broke into here was we tapped into the uh, intercom system in the dormitory so we could make announcements, order pizza, you know, open up the dorm, you know, do some things uh, without anybody knowing where it was coming from. So that was a lot of fun. But um, so today, I'm part of our criminal cybersecurity practice. We do uh, incident response, forensics, and investigations uh, all over the world, um, along with Lucy and, other, and, and others on our team. And we're based here in Nashville, so uh, we're local and um, happy to be here today. Yeah. Um, I'm Lucy Hayward. I also work for Pearl with Mark. Um, I've got about 15 years of security and uh, project management experience. My claim to fame is I worked for Target for about 11 years, and I spent a good part of that in the information security department, but I left well before the breach <laughs> happened or even started, so I had nothing to do with it. Uh, but I ended up here in Tennessee because of my husband's job, and um, I've been with Kroll now for about six years. My background is security, but I also have a background in project management, so that's the, the type of work that I do for the team. Um, I help out on large-scale data breaches as a project manager, and I also help our clients with what we're talking about today, with uh, building out their cyber incident response plans and testing them through tabletop exercises. I'm also president of the PMI Nashville chapter. This is my second year as chapter president, and um, I know from uh, planning our annual symposium what a lot of effort goes into putting on these types of events, so I think they've done a great job here. And um, Please make sure to thank all the volunteers who are giving up their time to put together this event so we can all learn CPEs and PDUs and network and have fun and learn something. So. <clears throat> so who here has an incident response plan at your organization? Couple people? Okay. Who's familiar with it? Okay. Who's had to use it? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> So one of the things that we do with our clients is we come in and help them build out an incident response plan. And we have seen uh, quite a wide variety of different plans. We work with companies that have nothing because they just haven't felt that they needed it or they didn't know where to start. We work with companies that have very detailed plans. And in some cases, they're a little too detailed. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through it. But really, an incident response plan, um, I love using the NIST definitions. Um, they're just the instructions and procedures that an organization can use to identify, respond to, and mitigate the effects of a cyber incident. And we're going to spend some time talking about the, the identification piece, because I think that's really the most important part, is being able to identify and know when you have an incident, so that you can invoke your plan, get your team together, and start responding and mitigating. <clears throat> what it's not is it's not a checklist, it's not a prescriptive list of things to do. Uh, we find that a lot of companies want us to help them put together a little checklist where they can tick things off. And, you know, Mark can certainly tell you with any, everything he's worked with, you know, the cases that I've been involved in, everything is different. You know, especially the things we're seeing now is not what we saw a year ago. And I'm sure we're going to start getting calls in six months for stuff that's completely different than what's out there now. So if you have that checklist, it really puts you um, in the position of... Um, you run the risk of not being able to do things that are on your checklist because they don't apply to your incident, and then that can be used against you later. So if your plan says you're going to do A, B, C, and D, and then you find out during the course of your investigation that, well, a couple of those steps really don't apply here and you don't do them, that can come back and haunt you later, especially if your breach becomes public, if there's litigation, et cetera. 
Um, the, one of the most detailed incident response plans I saw was down to like what they were going to do every 15 minutes. <laughs> and, you know, as a project manager, part of me likes that because I, I mean, I like lists and so I want to put a list together for everything. But, you know, they were saying like in 15 minutes we're going to get a, together a conference bridge and these 10 people are going to join and 30 minutes we're going to have this meeting and then 45 minutes we're going to have that meeting. And it's like, well, you know what? What if you miss that first 15 minute window? And what if this goes into litigation? And they come back and say, well, you said you were going to do this if you experienced an incident and you didn't. I mean, it sounds kind of silly, but those things can happen if you aren't careful. So some key questions that we're going to talk through. Um, first of all, why is it important to define an incident? Does anybody know? Yep, exactly. It's important that you have a definition, and the definition varies for um, every organization based on your industry, based on the type of data that you have, based on what your business is. But it's really important that you understand, because otherwise, um, everything could be an incident, right? And everything's not an incident. So how you need to determine how you're going to define an incident, how you're going to define an event, and how you're going to define a breach. <laughs> and what's the difference between them? And Mark, do you want to talk a little bit about why we should care? Why we should care. <laughs> yeah, we'll get into this a little bit. Um, but those words, and particularly things like breach and incident, event, can, can really be triggers. Increasingly, um, when you have lawyers involved, you have regulatory considerations involved, and those words have meaning. So if you're in IT and you're just throwing around like, oh my gosh, we've got a breach. I'm like, wait a minute. If you put that in an email, that can come back and punch you later on if you truly have an incident. So we'll get into mm -hmm. that a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, some of the important distinctions. Um, yeah, and we work with, there's a law firm that we do a lot of these incident response plans with to protect privilege, and there's a, an attorney that we work with who, he's like, don't ever use the word breach. Even if you have one, don't use the word breach. It's just got such a bad connotation. People hear the word breach and they immediately assume that you're in trouble, that you've got problems, and it's just not good. A resume generating them. A resume generating yes, <laughs> An RGE. I'm going to have to remember that. That's good. <laughs> so the NIST definition of an incident says a computer security incident is a violation or imminent threat of violation of computer security policies, acceptable use policies, or standard security practices. And I think this is a good starting point, but what do you think it's missing? If you put this in your plan, what are you at risk of? Too often. I'm sorry? Too often. Too, yeah, too often. Um, everything's an incident, right? If you've got an employee who's using his uh, uh, work computer to do some online gambling, that's probably a violation of your acceptable use policy, right? But it's not an incident. You're not going to investigate it. You're just going to maybe tell them not to do it anymore or give them a warning. Yeah. If we use this definition, we'd always be in incident response mode. We all have users. <laughs> so what we wrote, we work with our clients to come up with what their definition of an incident is. Uh, we see if you see down there, Mark. Yes. <laughs> um, so we recommend that you consider appending it with something, something like this, that it has the significant potential to lead to the following either a negative impact to your reputation, inappropriate access to PII or PHI or customer, da customer data, or loss of IP or funds. And it really depends on what's important to you. We tell our clients what would be your worst nightmare, right? Don't worry about how they got into your network. Just assume somebody's in your network and they have access to something. What would be the most traumatic thing that you could think of? And for some companies, it's you know, getting hold of their intellectual property if they have a proprietary tool or product. For some companies, you know, healthcare, PHI, if uh, somebody got access to that, that could be bad. Uh, your company's reputation, think about Target. I mean, they, they, they suffered some financial losses, but they're certainly not going to go out of business anytime soon, right? But it took a hit to their reputation by what happened. Um, so you really need to think about, and some of our clients will use, put a list of all of these if it has the potential to lead to any of these things we're going to consider it an, inc an incident. So, do you want to add to that? No? Okay. Does anybody have any questions so far? No? Okay. So, an event. Again, NIST definition says an event is any observable occurrence in a system or network, right? 
So you see some malware on somebody's computer, that's not really an incident. It's an, it's an event, right? And then we have adverse events, which has a negative consequence, a system crash, packet flood, unauthorized use of privileges, unauthorized access to data, execution of malware that destroys data. So this is probably a little bit more serious than your average event, but is it an incident yet? <clears throat> and I'll let Mark talk a little bit about this. Yeah, I think, so during my time when I was in enterprise IR, one of the things that we ran into frequently was uh, we had operational side of IT that used the term incident, right? Computer incident um, that, you know, that could be an outage. It could be, you know, an issue with an application. Lots of things that generate incidents. And so there was an entire plan that was about 100 pages just about how we respond to computer incidents. But it really had nothing to do with security related incidents. Um, and sometimes we could piggyback off that language as it related to security. One of the challenges was, okay, how do we plug into that? Because at some point, they may be investigating an incident, and then that incident may change because we now think that there's a security-related um, component to that issue. And so if you have plans like that, if you have folks, I think they're using IL, ITIL, uh, things like that, as part of that language, they use some of this terminology. But it may be different than what you consider as being from a, from a security standpoint. You want to make sure your plans are complementary or that there's trigger points mm -hmm. for when you might actually invoke a security incident. Yeah, and, and also make sure, this is why it's important to have that definition established of an event versus an incident. I was just with a client this last week doing a tabletop exercise, and they call every event, they refer to it as an incident. That's like their cultural language, it's in all their documentation. So for them to try and change it, they acknowledge it would be very difficult. They also see the problem of calling everything an incident. And so we've had a couple, uh, worked with a couple of organizations like that, and we recommend that they establish a separate word such as crisis, to refer to an actual incident. However, the industry standard language is generally referred to it as an incident versus an event. <clears throat> okay, I think we've talked about this a little bit, being careful about using the, brief, the B word. <laughs> um, you know, especially um, when you're sending out emails internally, when you're conducting an investigation. Uh, so a breach generally occurs when you've lost control of certain types of sensitive data. And, you know, it, people like to throw the word breach around. Um, we've been breached, we've been hacked, um, somebody's in our network. You know, you need to just be careful about how you're referring to things, especially um, in writing. Also, talk to counsel. Um, as soon as you suspect that you may have an investigator or an incident. Yes? Okay. Yeah, this is Don, which is... We've defined in our organization that the B word is never be used. We actually train people. That is an unacceptable word in this organization. And there's only one place that can declare a breach, and that's counsel. Nobody in IT or other parts of the industry can declare a breach. Mm -hmm. Only counsel can declare a breach. That's very good. That's, that's very good. I've never heard of a company being very that strict about the use of the word breach. So I think that's great that you are. And um, it's, it's a legal construct. Yeah. Like breach is yep. not a technical event. No. Mm -hmm. It's a legal nope. construct. Yep. Absolutely. And and I think having uh, counsel be the one to declare that you've got an incident or a breach, I think that's great. And that's one of the things we'll talk about in a little bit. We'll go through a process flow of an incident, and we always recommend that you have. And it varies by organization, but we always recommend that you have that one person who has that authority, and only that person can declare an incident. So when building out your incident response plan, there's a number of components that you need to have um, in your plan. You know, first you want to have your incident definition, and you need to figure out what makes sense for your organization. It should clearly state who's got that authority. A lot of times it's counsel, sometimes it's a CISO, sometimes it's a CIO or a senior IT exec. We tend to work with a lot of medium-sized companies because they're the ones who generally need the most help. Most larger organizations have their own incident response team or incident response department, so um, sometimes a, a more medium-sized organization doesn't have a CIO or a CISO, but you just need to establish who that is. Um, you need to understand that declaring an incident invokes the plan, and it convenes the incident response team. Your definition may be different than NIST. We, we like it as a starting point, so I think it helps you focus on what you need to think about. And then again, be careful when using the word breach. The slides are available, right? Yes. Yep. 
And I don't know if everybody can see this. Um, I should have brought up a little cat toy, um, laser pointer. Um, so when we work with our customers, we help them put together some form of this incident response process flow. It varies based on your company and your structure, but it generally works. So if you go at the very far bottom there on the left, you'll see uh, number one, there's a couple different ways an incident can start out. And it always starts out as an event, right? So you might have the end user who calls the help desk because they've got a problem with their computer, so they call and they report it. Uh, up at the top, you might uh, have a system alerts generated, and it goes to the information security team, and they review it and triage it. Or you might get a call from law enforcement. Has anybody ever gotten that call? Has the FBI ever called? Uh, local, share. local share, yeah. You might get a phone call from law enforcement. Um, you may also hear from a third-party vendor if you work with somebody who has a software that's been breached and they feel that it may impact your company. But all three of those will eventually flow up to the incident response team lead, who is usually the CISO, senior manager in information security, CIO, and that person will conduct an, an initial investigation. So sometimes it's pretty obvious that you've got something going on based on an alert or the FBI calls. Sometimes you need to do a little bit more investigating. You need to pull up some logs. Um, and this is what he does, so. <laughs> the deeper analysis, yes, yeah. Yeah, the so deeper analysis. We'll talk about that in some later slides. Um, and you, then you need to determine, does it meet our definition? So is it an incident? And if it's not, then you resolve the event and you go on your merry way. If it is, then you declare an incident and you convene the incident response team. And then you conduct your investigation. So over here we've got a number of incident response team activities. So depending on what, what you have going on, you may need to notify law enforcement that you've got an incident. Uh, there may be regulatory agencies that you need to notify. You may need to notify your insurance carrier. How many of you have a cyber insurance policy that you know of? You can't get one. <laughs> There's a story there, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> um, you need to notify your insurance carrier, and we recommend that whoever in your organization handles your insurance policy be on that team, because they'll know the ins and outs of your policies, they'll know who needs to be notified at your carrier, when, all that good stuff. Um, you may need to bring in third-party forensics, so you may need to call Kroll or somebody else to help you out. Um, we generally recommend that uh, you bring in third-party, uh, the three C's, capability, capacity, and conflict. So does your team have the capability to conduct the investigation? You may or may not, depending on what resources you have. Um, do you have the capacity? I mean, everybody has their day jobs, right? So if something like this comes up, you've got to pull people off their day jobs, and, and are you able to do that? If you're at your busy time of year, you might not have the resources available. Or conflict. If it involves an internal um, party, if it's your CEO, or like for example, um, who's the car with the, the emissions? Was that Volkswagen? Volkswagen? Okay, I keep wanting to say BMW, but <laughs> um, I mean, would it have looked good for Volkswagen to be investigating themselves? Probably not. So that's when you want to bring in a third party forensics. You may also want to bring an outside counsel to advise you. Um, you may need to make notifications to your customers, your clients, your employees. You may also need to uh, notify the media as well, depending on the nature of the incident. So these are all ongoing incident or ongoing activities. You'll also have your mitigation and remediation activities ongoing. And then, but then eventually you'll get to a point where you close the investigation and then you'll conduct your lessons learned. Does anybody have any questions about this? I know it's kind of hard to see. Yes. I was making a remark on a lot of the outside forces. You may want your counsel to be the one who invokes those contracts, not your sister, not your sales, it's other than your exactly. one. Exactly. One. What? One. One. So you want to protect the privilege of your investigation. So at any point when you get to a point where you think you have a real incident, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, yeah. you know, counsel is going to be leading a lot of the, of the direction on where this goes. Um, and they're going to have some responsibility for helping decide you know, who is going to be involved in the breach notification, who's going to be involved, you know, in those decisions around, you know, by law enforcement, you not, uh, yeah. things of that nature. Uh, we see a lot you know, around the insurance side, a lot more clients these days who have cyber policies. The insurance carriers now go a long way in terms of specifying what forensic company or one of several companies you can actually use 
to have an investigation conducted if you're going to file a claim under that policy. So that's that's important to kind of know up front um, and maybe have a chance to build that relationship with that firm, go ahead and have agreements in place and stuff like that, so that if, if you do need to call them in, things progress very quickly and you don't get bogged down with paperwork and things like that. Tell me if I'm wrong, but I think one of the most important steps here is to have only one person talk to the media. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. That person yeah. <coughs> Yeah. Absolutely. And we find that one of the teams that people tend to forget about when um, putting together their, their incident response team is media or public relations or communications. And they really need to be involved right from the beginning. Even if you don't end up needing to release a public statement, they can be working on it. And especially if it's something where you think the media might start calling you, they can have a statement, a holding statement prepared and be ready to respond. You know. And also, some of our larger customers in those situations, you know, send out communications to the internal team that are involved, making sure that, that no one talks to the media, and there's things like that that you want to consider. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times we see internal confidentiality agreements that are signed, even above and beyond maybe a standard employment agreement, but hey, if you're going to be read into a certain project or a certain incident, make absolutely sure you hold this at a certain level of confidence mm -hmm. until all the decisions are made about you know, how that gets publicized. Yep. And they, they can also send out communications to your employees if it becomes public knowledge on how to respond on social media. Because you can tell your employees, hey, don't comment on Facebook, don't post anything on LinkedIn. But they're going to get inquiries from their friends, from their family. And so you want to make sure that they're putting, helping you put out the message out there that you want the public to have, rather than just griping about it with their friends. <clears throat> Okay, so security levels or severity levels. How do you establish a severity level for an incident? You don't. It's a trick question. <laughs> One of the most common things that we see in somebody's incident response plan is they will want to establish a severity level one, two, three, high, medium, low, um, whatever nomenclature they want to use. And we recommend that you don't do that because if it's an incident, it's an incident. All hands on deck. You've got the team together. Everybody's working to mitigate. Everybody's working to remediate. And you're conducting the investigation. What ends up happening is if you establish a severity level, um, you might mislabel it, right? I think severity levels are very common with help desk triaging, which makes sense because if it's only impacting one user, you know, it's probably not as big of a deal as if an entire department has a problem. But what if that one user that you're investigating, it's, it's the C CEO. What if there's some malware on his computer? One person, but it's the CEO. You know, it's probably a bigger deal. <clears throat> and when you start your investigation, you don't know all the facts yet either, right? A lot of times we'll be brought in and there's like maybe one or two machines involved. And then we'll start investigating. And it's like, oh, look, now there's three or four. Um, the, the client that we were just with, we got up to, what, 70? Yeah, we got up to 70 machines, but it took a few weeks to get to that point. So you may not know how big or how bad it's going to be, so don't worry about a label. If it's an incident, if it meets that definition, then you want to treat it as top priority, code red, whatever. Another thing you want to have as part of your plan is a roles and responsibilities definition. It should identify everybody who's on the team. Uh, all the IT resources, and all the non-IT resources. So your marketing and communications, HR should be part of it because if there's an employee involved, you want to make sure you've got HR on the team so that they can help protect employees' rights. Um, I was once working on an investigation where it ended up being an employee, um, but they identified the wrong employee to start with, and he was arrested. And um, and actually, though, I think in that case, HR was the ones who were pushing for the arrest. But this was also in the UK where for the police to question you, you have to be arrested. They can't just bring you in for questioning. So they wanted to talk to this young man because uh, the company decided that he was the one who did it. And so they arrested him. And turns out they were way off base, um, which was really unfortunate. But, you know, here in the U.S., we recommend that you have HR involved. <laughs> so... Um, you also want to outline the role of each member. So who can make those key decisions? So who can declare an incident? Who is responsible for working with perhaps if you've got a team of forensic investigators involved? Um, if you've got people who are doing analysis, um, you know, you want to have somebody in charge of uh, directing that work. 
That way everybody understands what their role is. And you can either define it as a single team, so anytime you have an incident, all of these people are involved, or it can be just a core team, and then you add ad hoc members as needed, because you may not need HR if there's no employee involvement. You may not need um, marketing or public relations, um, depending on the nature of the incident. So it's really what works best for you and your company. So here are some uh, team members that we recommend that you consider definitely legal. Uh, lawyers are our friends when investigating. Uh, your CISO or your CIO, so you want to have a management resource and you also want to have a technical resource. You're probably going to need some technical leads, so network, infrastructure, HR, PR and marketing, and then risk management slash insurance, whoever handles that. So we recommend that your team consist of at least this. Ah, know who is driving the bus. <laughs> you know, it's we've been involved in investigations where it seems like nobody has ownership of anything, um, and it gets very chaotic, right? Yeah, to say the least. I think that that's probably one of the most key things. I mean, especially if you get to a larger intrusion, it's like you need somebody who has the the political capital and the knowledge to drive that investigation forward, to work closely with counsel, and make make sure things are getting done. Uh, we run into we run into situations a lot. We'll talk about this later, where you know maybe IT is kind of trying to drive the bus on something, and, and they don't really have a full understanding of the business implications of what they're dealing with. They may also slow themselves down based on sort of political considerations, where they think, oh, we can't really do this, but that'll be too impactful for the business, and we're not going to go make this change yep. to, as part of containment. Um, and so, you know, in an incident, it's kind of a totally different ballgame. So you want to make sure you've got the right person. It has the original authority to get things done, and that's probably you know, one of the key 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 mm -hmm. factors that, that we run into. One person that I don't have on this list that we, we recommend is that you have a project manager involved. Shameless plug <laughs> for my profession here, but it's really helpful for us. I will go with the team when we have a large scale investigation, and I will help coordinate deliverables. So we'll request that the client provide us with a lot of information and logs and images and you know we'll need to interview people and get background information about their different systems and you know how they work and so I'll go on site with the team and help coordinate that and I have found that when we walk into an investigation and they've got a project manager on their end that makes things so much easier because we've got that single point of contact who knows who to talk to you know if we say we need these log files they know where to get them they can help us coordinate all of that so that we can just go with one person versus having to try and track down 20 people to get what we need. It's definitely not a must. If you don't have that type of person in your organization, you know, it's fine, but it definitely helps make things go a little bit more smoothly. <clears throat> so communication. Your plan should also include a communication process for who owns communication. So, you know, who is allowed to talk to the media? Who is allowed to communicate with your third-party vendors, your forensics, your counsel? Who sends out the communication to employees if it's necessary to do that? Um, and then also, how do you set up secure communications for the team, right? Do you have a war room? Can you dedicate a conference room? A lot of times when we go on site, we try to be as unobtrusive as possible, and they'll put us up in a conference room, and we just kind of hang out there. And, um, <laughs> um, it's me and a bunch of guys in a conference room, which is always fun. Um, <laughs> Um, corporate email, is it safe to, to use that? You know, has your email been compromised? Yeah, we see this a lot where uh, corporate email systems may be either they're the focus of initial intrusion or it's identified later that, oh yeah, the attacker has gotten into your email. And oftentimes, it's if you don't have two-factor authentication and sort of basic you know, initial layers of security on your email system, it's going to be something we're really leery about using at the outset of the incident as well as communications between ourselves. Uh, so we would recommend, in some cases, companies have separate out-of-band sort of encrypted systems or we'll, you know, have everybody go set up an own sort of generic Gmail account or something that they use out-of-band for that communication. But even if, even at that, we try to minimize sort of communication. It's mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff, you know, will come back around if, if that incident turns into something serious. Those emails, um, you know, are going to be part and parcel to the litigation and other things that, that might go on. So. Uh, but something to think about, kind of have that in your plan, what are you going to do in those situations? And like I mentioned, kind of, you know, what are you writing now? You know, if you're in IT and you're like, hey, the sky isn't falling, don't put that in email. You know, go talk to somebody. Uh, it's a lot easier to, um, you know, convey that verbally in 
I have come back to you, Ms. Ms. Red, later on. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, okay, and then just define who owns the communication with the external parties. You know, who's going to talk to council, insurance, law enforcement, regulators. A lot of times this will go through council, um, and that's what we recommend. Oh, and then who has to talk to the C-suite, right? Um, a lot of times the CEO, CIO, they may not be there day to day with you, but they want that daily update. So you need to define what that update's going to look like, how often you do that. We recommend generally once a day. We'll try to schedule a status call once a day. Um, the case we just got off of, we had a status call. We had a status call to get ready for the status call. <laughs> so sometimes it's a little bit overkill, and, it, and, and all of that takes time away, right? Every time you have a status meeting, you've got to get it ready. Um, you've got to prepare your update, and that can take away time from conducting the investigation. So you've got to be, yes? Well, I'm not from the CSA Yeah, and, and sometimes that's what you need to do is, um, you know, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll send out a daily status report or I'll coordinate the daily call um, and try to run interference because one thing that we found that can be very um, time consuming for us is when the CEO comes into the war room and wants to sit there and talk to us about the incident for an hour and a half. Yeah, and we're going to have separate rooms for this. <laughs> it's like, hey, yeah, you come here, yep. but all the yep. analysts are over here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so it's, you know, but yeah, you've got to have that plan and, um, you know, certainly send out as soon as something urgent becomes known or important, definitely share it out. But don't have status reports just for the sake of having a status report. Contact lists. Your plan should also include an appendix with um, information about how to get a hold of anybody on the incident response team. Uh, not just office communication, but home, how to get a hold of them at home. So we recommend you include their their desk phone, their cell phone, their home phone, a personal email if you can, so you can get a hold of them. And review it quarterly because people Twitter leave. Account. What? Twitter, yeah. Twitter, Twitter account, account. yeah. <laughs> um, but Snapchat. review and update it quarterly. Like, I've looked at incident response plans where people, oh, yeah, he hasn't worked here in a year and a half, and, you know, that, that's not going to do anybody any good. <laughs> and we should also suggest that you... Um, uh, critical vendor service pro oh yeah Mark, did you put that in there Mark and Lucy <laughs> um, but put in a you know include some of your vendors that you work with that you might need to call um, what are their emergency contact and what's their emergency contact information if you need to get a hold of them in the evenings or on the weekends and then we also suggest if you have a 24 by 7 help desk that you keep this list with the help desk so if you get a call and you can't find somebody's phone number for whatever reason, if you're on your phone, you don't have the, the list, you can always call the help desk and get it and have them get in touch with somebody. <clears throat> oh, yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Well, I think, yeah, one of the things that comes up when we see a lot, you know, in responding to an incident is that the company, we <laughs> show up, we get there, people don't have any idea a way to communicate to us or to their team. What are their applications? Where is their critical data existence organization? How is their network laid out? Where are your, you know, what sources of audit information and you know logs and other things do you have that we can use to investigate the incident? We spend a lot of time trying to just gather up this information. We get a lot of misinformation, we get wrong information, and it really can hurt the overall response, particularly containment efforts. Uh, if you're trying to figure out how to get your arms around and stop the bleeding, and you, you're working from that around data information, so that's. Things like that are going to be key, and those are going to be the first questions any vendor you bring in or any outside help are going to begin to ask you. So be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. So the process, we, we uh, looked at the process full a little bit earlier. Um, make sure that you've got all the steps outlined in your process, um, starting with incident reporting and ending with lessons learned. Don't get bogged down with the internal status reports. And then clearly indicate when the team is convened. And make sure IT and security knows the plan, they're familiar with the plan, and that you don't delay. Um, one of the things that we recommend with our clients in terms of declaring an incident, if they've gone 24 hours and they're still not sure if they have an incident, you know what, you probably have an incident. If you can't close the door on it and put it to bed, you've probably got an incident. Yeah, about a year or so ago, I was brought in to basically be an expert uh, witness for a government case that was looking at an incident response to a major intrusion that was out there. Um, and one of the things that I found in my analysis, and again, go back to emails, go back to communications from like six, seven, eight years ago, 
uh, the IT department and, and even some security folks knew they had an issue for weeks and months before they actually declared an incident, before they actually brought in senior enough people and said, wait a minute guys, we've got a problem. They were trying to deal with it internally, they were trying to keep it quiet, and they had a plan that said, hey, this is what we do during an incident, they can do it. And so that became a big issue um, during the litigation. And they're like, hey, you kind of had this over here with your team. And, and the IT folks that were involved even said, well, we weren't really aware of the details of this plan. Um, so we thought we were kind of doing this thing over here. But, but the reality was they were they hurt the business uh, through that delay. So uh, I think that's a really important thing is making sure IT folks that are being most likely to discover something know how to, how to get the right people involved and invoke that plan. And then testing the plan. You want to review it at least quarterly um, and make any updates. And, oh, go ahead. You go back to that last slide. Yeah. So I think it's important to definitely pull that, you know, that chain, right, when you think you've got an incident in place. But in some instance, can't you hurt the business? Can't you hurt your operational staff if you're pulling that chain too often? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think in the case I'm referring to, um, there was there was what was that? Yeah, I think I think that's where having the right person, you know, whoever's kind of in charge, particularly from a technical side, that's got a clear, clear, rational head. It's like, okay, yeah, we've got a problem here or not, you know. And, and I think the case that I'm thinking of, um, some sort of mid-level folks were. Noodling around some system administrators and some analysts were like, you know, looking at stuff for weeks and weeks that they kind of saw as unusual, but they never told their, uh, they never told their boss essentially who, who had oversight of the security and the IT, um, sort of globally. So it just kind of sat. So yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's definitely a consideration, but I, I think, you know, I would want to err on the side of over communicating that not. And we'll talk about the importance of some of that in, in the last second. We're talk about. Um, so review the plan quarterly, make updates. It can just be a quick 20-minute review, make sure any contact information is updated. Um, did roles change? Because you may go through a restructuring. Um, and then test the plan annually to identify any gaps. One of the things that we work with our clients is to conduct an annual tabletop exercise and we'll create scenarios, walk them through the scenarios. And that's certainly something you can do yourself. You know, either bring in a professional to do it or, you know, sit down, take a half a day and talk through, okay, something happened, what do we do? Does everybody know what their role is? Does everybody know who to contact? What if it happens on the weekend? Can we get a hold of people? Do we know how to reach people? <clears throat> ah, yeah, so tabletop exercise. So it just helps you identify the gaps in the plan. It helps strengthen the communication between the stakeholders. Sometimes we work with customers who, the, when they come into the room to do the tabletop is the first time they've met some of the people in the room. So a lot of times you've got, you know, communications doesn't work with IT on a regular basis. HR doesn't always work with, you know, security on a regular basis. So a lot of times that's the first time they're actually talking. And then it just helps you become familiar with all the key definitions, the process flow, the decision-making criteria. And then by talking through it on a regular basis, it'll help you adapt it because cybersecurity is incredibly dynamic. It's changing all the time. And so you need to be able to take that framework that you have and know how to apply it um, almost intuitively. Okay, so this is where Mark is going to take yes. over. <laughs> And we'll talk about some uh, yeah, so day just, zero. I just want to walk through, you know, real last year, and we just came out of this in the last few weeks at a major incident um, out on the West Coast. And um, it was kind of interesting because this particular organization has a fairly uh, strong technical set of resources at their disposal as well. We were brought in to assist. Um, but, you know, you get called in on the first day. And what are the things that you're going to be thinking about? One of the things that we see over and over again when you walk into that room, uh, you know, communication security plan. How are we going to start talking about this? So that may be something you're going to test off at IR plan. Uh, do we use digital certificates? Do we have an outside, you know, system that we can use? Um, and we've seen time and time again, picked out incidents that could end up having an insider component. The person involved in it could be sitting right next to us. Um, they could be overhearing what you're talking about. If you're going to feel scary about, you know, all the place. Um, you know, you may be 
uh, you know, giving away that there's some awareness of something going on. So just be thinking about that. Uh, find a good place to have those meetings where you're going to have those war rooms. Um, it might be kind of out of the way. And, uh, and just consider some of those factors. So, yeah, ensure counsel is yeah. present. Um, you know, some of the best organizations I've worked with, you know, we get on the phone, and there's 10 or 12 people on the phone. If, if the right attorney is not on that meeting, we're just sitting there. We're not going to say a word. We want to protect the privilege of that investigation. So if you bring us in um, on an incident, we're going to highly recommend that you know, we're engaged with counsel. Anything you do, even internally, you can stand with counsel present so that your organization can protect, protect the uh, information that's being exchanged from, from outside parties as much as possible. So, uh, yeah, reporting the facts. So, especially if you're in IT, you know, maybe your day job is just an IT administrator, you're in security. Your IR is not your life, but you're brought in because you've got some specific knowledge. Maybe you manage the firewalls, maybe you manage IDS, maybe you manage the application that we can just breach. Um, think about how you're going to communicate in those meetings. And so reporting the facts, I can't emphasize that enough. And you know, we find folks that come in and we start asking questions. Okay, what about, you know, how, how is this application set up? You know, how are you, where do you have firewalls? What, what do you do here? What do you do there? And so often, the folks that are put on the spot, essentially, to talk about that, if they don't know, they might make something up, or they'll, they'll provide an answer that's not, you know, that's like they think is right, but they don't communicate that as, look, you know, I think this is correct, but I'm not sure, let me get back to you. So, you know, talk about the resume creating <laughs> situation, you know, just, it's, it's okay to not know. Um, you know it's, not, it's not okay to speculate without being very clear if you're speculating. Um, the other thing is hysteria. We, we, uh, in a recent event that we've been dealing with, um, and a large intrusion, the client, uh, had brought in another forensics firm initially, um, to investigate this incident. And they'd done some analysis and found some things. And essentially, you know, they did discover that, uh, the domain controllers of this organization and the account, account database have essentially been taken. Um, and their, their sort of comment to the business is like, everything's owned, everything's been breached, and you guys are totally owned. <coughs> it's like, what's the business going to do with that information? Right? Like, that doesn't really help them solve the thing. Uh, it just generates hysteria. Um, and so, you know, that may be true. It may be true that all those accounts are taken. But that's not the question we're here to answer. In the investigation, we want to we learn all the facts we can about what actually happened. If those credentials were taken, were they used? They might have been used. I mean, we see cases where actors get so far as to, you know, zip up, compress up the sensitive data, the crown jewels, but they don't get a chance to exfiltrate. So yeah, we can say, yeah, okay, that guy owns your server, but he didn't get the data, and that's a big deal. So um, again, just as you go in near those situations, be very mindful of speaking with in terms of facts. So yeah, so some of the things that. You know, as you go through those initial meetings, what are the key questions that are going to come up, um, and both through counsel uh, as well as the investigative team and the business team? Um, from a technical perspective, ultimately we want to figure out where did this incident start? You know, who is patient zero? Um, you know, if, if, if it's sort of an internal intrusion, you know, where did that intrusion start from? Uh, if it's a web server breach, you know, when did it happen? Which server did it happen on? What, what was exploited? Um, from a timeline perspective, we want to get back to that initial uh, beginning stages of the incident. And we, sometimes we may never know. It may have happened so long ago that there's just no record, the systems no longer exist, uh, things like that. But ultimately, these are kind of things that we want to answer the questions to. Uh, sometimes there's a question of lateral movement. You know, did the actor, yeah, we know the actor got on this particular system, but did, could they go anywhere else? Did they get anywhere else? And that's where those you know, questions about your network architecture become really important. Um, you know, there may be an exchange of technical indicators. And back to your point, you know, if, if someone in IT or security, you know, sees something, you know, they're going to come to the table with, okay, what do we know? Well, yeah, we, you know, we saw a connection to this IP address or this domain, or we saw, you know, a detection of this threat on this system, things of that nature. But be able to speak as intelligently as you can based on what you know about <laughs> that incident. Uh, you know, as mentioned, sometimes, Sometimes all you know, we had a case a few months ago where you know it started with the FBI showed up at their door and said, "Hey, is this your data? Yeah, we just saw it for sale, you know, on an underground marketplace." Um, and so then the scramble was like, "Wow, where did that data come from?" And in this case, I think it was a healthcare organization, 
And they're like, man, that data could have been on this system, or this system, or this system, or, you know, and so there was a huge process just to kind of figure that out. Um, and we, we ran down some dead ends. We got some bad information along the way. And it, it probably delayed that process. Um, the timing of most recent events. You know, you're going to want to know how long ago did this happen? How recent has it been? Um, and then what are the unknowns? Because there's going to be a lot of things that you don't know at the outset. And, and having an intelligent understanding of what do we really not know, and again, going back to the facts, um, is going to help determine you know, which way the investigation goes, what are the next steps that we want to take in getting to the bottom of, of the incident. So yeah, so in those initial conversations, um, you know, some just points there around how that, how that discussion goes. A lot of times council is going to be leading some of that conversation because they got a problem they need to solve, which is, hey, can we have something that's reportable? We have something that we've got to go notify on. Uh, how significant is this really? So they need good information to kind of determine those things. Um, you know, the business may be interested in, hey, I've got a lot of customers with contractual obligations. I need to know, is this particular data repository at risk? Because I may have to go let my customers know um, based on some you know, contractual arrangement we have with them. Um, and, you know, again, getting the answers quickly. What are the next, next steps we can do to, to narrow the scope of this and answer the problems as fast as we can? Um, there's always many conversations about bringing in law enforcement. And we, we do some presentations just on that topic. Um, and I'm sure many of you may have heard um, guys in the bureau here in town, locally or in your own jurisdiction, that they do a great job with, with kind of networking and trying to trying to build relationships with the community. Because they, you know, there are times where you need their assistance. Uh, there are other times where you may want to take a step back and think about, uh, you know, is this something I need to, to notify? Because um, law enforcement really has a different uh, objective with their police. So if they get involved, they want to they want to identify who the actor is. They want to go prosecute somebody. They're not worried about, hey, you got a breach. I've got state notification requirements. I've got these legal requirements over here. That's really not their space to be in. So if you do bring them in, you want to make sure that you're coordinating that in such a way that it doesn't impair the other pieces of your investigation. While at the same time, if there is a good opportunity to to um, attribute the attack to a certain person or group, then yeah, maybe we want to go after those folks um, and seek prosecution. So those are kind of two separate threads of the, of the overall case. And so initially you may say, yeah, no, we're not quite ready to do that. But as you get further in the investigation, you may come back around and say, okay, now's a good time to bring them in um, and get them up to speed. And just to add, too, on the evidence seizure, they may take evidence that you need to investigate. So um, the, I was talking, my, my direct boss actually used to work for the FBI, and he said we'd get evidence in, and sometimes it would sit with us for three to six months before we would get to it because something more important would come in than your one computer. Yes? In transporting, you realize it's a business perspective. Law enforcement doesn't consider the business lives. Right, exactly. They have their own agenda, and it is not necessarily the same as yours. Yep. They stand on that same time frame. Sometimes, sometimes you can get reprieves. So if you're, like we had a recent case where, you know, we were able to delay notification obligations because of um, the Bureau's involvement on the need to, we we're actually trying to get attribution by working with them to identify the actor and sort of set up a, almost like a sting operation, if you will. Um, and so we were able to forestall that notification process. But in terms of giving them evidence, I'm not going to give them anything unless I have a copy of it as well so that I can continue with my investigation um, and not impede that. So they can be really good friends, you know, definitely bring them in at times, but, but think about how that, that flow might work. Um, and then you're going to talk about containment. Again, those early, early stages, we've got the investigative piece, trying to find out as much as we can know about the incident. But then we've also got the containment question, like, okay, how do we bring this to closure? How do we stop the bleeding? Um, and sometimes those kind of go in different directions. The, um, you know, and depending on the nature of what's compromised, you know, you may say, look, you know, we see organizations, they identify an issue, they found an IP address, and it's like, okay, let's go block that IP. You know, we're going to block that IP address. Hackers aren't going to be stymied st st by blocking a single IP address. Um, you may just actually help the attacker learn that you're onto them because you've suddenly blocked one IP address. So thinking about the containment process, what are the right steps? You know, and often we don't want to go into a lot of technical containment until we really understand how this incident started. Um, 
and sometimes there's pressures. You know, if you've got active bleeding, you know, somebody's in your core database and you see them exfiltrating data, yeah, okay, let's cut that off. Maybe we don't know everything just yet, but we need to stop that bleeding. But in other cases, we may say, hey, look, you know, we kind of need to let this go for a little while longer. Let's monitor that IP. Let's gather some more facts before we try to cut them off. And a good partner, you know, not done a lot of this, can help you make those decisions, you know, in the best interest of the business. Um, yeah, so we talked about that, you know, some of the specific things early on. You know, oh man, we stopped this bleeding because we, we disabled this, you know, we had access to Joe's account and we blocked it. It's probably not the only account that they have, they just don't come back in. So, um, you know, again, those are, those are good things to think about. Um, a lot of room on team a chance to speak. We, we run into this sometimes. Um, you know, there are folks sitting in that room, and you may be one of them that has inside information. But if you're like me, kind of an introvert, I don't like speaking out, you know, and disrupting things. And, and sometimes the chair of the meetings can railroad through stuff and, and don't give a chance for everyone on the team to share information about the incident. So one thing I like to do is kind of look at everybody and say, hey, anything else you want to add? You have questions? You have comments? Uh, because you're going to need the input from everybody. Uh, when you're in those mm -hmm. in those trenches, um, you know, we're talking about scheduling. You know, we, we kind of covered this earlier. Particularly, you're meeting one or two times a day. Is this an all night, all hands on deck night, and weekend kind of thing? And I understand that. And you're kind of continuing to iterate through those processes until the incident is resolved. Mm -hmm. And then lessons learned. One thing we also I just want to touch on as a project manager, I love doing lessons learned because I like to close things up and tie a little bow around it, but you really want to be careful when you document your lessons learned after an incident because if the incident was a direct result of something you should have done and you didn't, or something that you knew about and you didn't address right away, you might not want to put that in writing. Or if you do document your lessons learned, do it at the direction of counsel, and counsel has the only copy of those lessons learned. So because <laughs> you don't want, in, the, in case that it's a, a big investigation or it gets a lot of attention or becomes public knowledge and there's litigation, you don't want somebody to have a document outlining exactly what you did wrong and that you knew that you were doing wrong. So. I've also seen cases where the lessons learned cover things that needed to have been done that had been talked about for a long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then just had not gotten off the ground. It was like, oh, this is a lesson learned. Like, no, actually, you really knew about this three years ago. And you didn't implement that system without control. Mm -hmm. so. so, so thank you. Uh, we really enjoyed being here today. You know, we're definitely willing to answer any questions you have. Our contact info is here. I'm happy to give you one of my cards. I'll gladly email the slides out to anybody who wants them. I don't know if there's a plan for distributing them through B-sides or not, but um, if you want the slides, come see me, and I'll give you my card, and I'll be happy to... Send them out to you. Yes. Uh, a couple of points that you made. One was not relying on checklists. The other was knowing the plan by heart. I understand how poorly defined checklists can, can throttle or short circuit the process, mm -hmm. cause you to fail. But also, I don't believe most organizations can rely on their staff knowing the plan by heart. And well structured, rather open checklists that prevent you from missing something seem like a good idea. I think for me the key in that statement is really knowing that you have a plan and knowing you know, the key folks that might be brought in, you know, know that there's this resource over here that we've thought about it. And we, we went through, we actually dealt with a large breach in an organization last year that had gone through a planning process with us about a year or so before that and gone through the tabletops and stuff. And throughout, they were coming on how, wow, you know, like, and they had their act together. Mm -hmm. And they, they said a number of times, like, look, you know, we remember when we went through this exercise a year and a half ago and how, how much that helped them think through and make sure the right people were at the table. And I think that's the key thing. Yeah. Um, what you don't want to do is create that plan, just in a vacuum in IT and stick it over in a corner on a file server. Yeah. If you don't then use it, then you've actually created a liability for yourself uh, down the road. So. And it's really about understanding the communication points and knowing if we suspect something is going on, who is that person that makes that decision? Who do we need to notify that incident response team lead? What we find, we'll come into organizations and we'll start talking to them and they'll say, well, we don't have an incident response plan. But when we start talking to them, we ask them, well, if you saw something suspicious, what would you do? A lot of them do have an institutionalized process or they have that knowledge already in place. It's just very informal. It's not documented. And so we just help them get it down on paper so that it's got a more formal structure around it. But it's, it's really about understanding that communication and how to get a hold of people 
um, and who to talk to. Yes? Uh, we have needs to be specifically with, uh, for example, state uh, educational institutions or other unionized environments where uh, it's a uh, kind of a distorted uh, responsibility. Sure. Yeah, we work with um, one university that's pretty large that has a lot of very decentralized, and it, it's a challenge because they, a lot of times their uh, their security team doesn't necessarily know what's going on in all of these different departments. And so it's definitely an ongoing communication, um, and what they're really working to do is understand where all the important data is, like the research data, so they know what needs to be protected, and it helps them determine what's truly at risk if something is discovered. Uh, do, do you uh, employ such uh, uh, strategic approach, for example, like uh, the more seniority person has in the United States, the less uh, um, uh, risky items they are entitled to have on the uh, network? <laughs> That's <laughs> <nice. laughs> That, like, uh, for example, sanitizing Excel from uh, possible scripts uh, in bed. Or yeah. We, we, I mean, we definitely work with organizations that do additional sort of security controls around their C-suite systems, you know, high value targets, and they do additional sort of targeted monitoring of those systems for activity. And I think that's sort of part of your part of the, uh, the actual Any other questions? Okay, well thank you all for being here today.